The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 18 is where we're going to be. We're going to begin reading at verse number 1, terminate at verse number 4. Youth month was great. I hadn't preached all month long, so just be considerate of that. <laughs> However you translate that, I need you to consider that. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. Now everybody say Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz. And you can learn this. This is not difficult. Now watch this. He was 25 years old when he came, when he became king and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Uh, you, you guys notice something right away in verse number three? I asked you to repeat the bottom of verse number one, and you said in your repetition, uh, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz. But in verse number three, it says that Hezekiah did everything right, like David, his father. But verse one says that Hezekiah is the son of Ahaz. We're going to understand that in a moment. And, get, and, and pull the application out in just a moment. He removed the high places. Everybody say high places. high places. And broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpents that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it. And it was called Nehushtan. Do you see this? Turn to somebody and say, it's time to break your idols down. That's right. Now turn to the other person. I, you know, I'm right here. I can see you. I, I, I don't know at what point do you think I can't see you. So turn to a real person. It needs to be somebody that you talk to. It doesn't need to be the air. I know you can talk to the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you, turn to a visible person and say it's time to break your idols down. Some of you are scaring me. You're scaring me. Getting nervous. Security. <laughs> Idolatry. One of the oldest sins uh, one of the most disdained sins of God, idolatry. Anything you put in the place of God, anything you posture like God, anything you have an expectation of as God, and anything you adore as God, and anything you elevate to God is an idol. All right. for, for however long you do it, it is an idol. All right. God hates sin but he's nauseated by idolatry. Are you understanding this? I hate lima beans, but I'm nauseated by buttermilk. You understand that? It's, a, it, it, it's, it's not just disdain. It's, it's something that goes deeper. It's deep disdain. God does not like to be replaced and God does not like being put on a committee. From the very beginning of the Bible, the first five books of the Pentateuch, Exodus chapter 20 and verse number two, one of the very ten commandments that God established with his people is he says, I am the Lord and you shall have no other gods before me. I am God by myself. Then in verse number five, God clears it up and becomes more specific. He just downright says, I am God and I'm a jealous God. In other words, don't put God, any other God before me. I am God and I'm a jealous God. And idolatry has seemed to be the issue that the people of God has struggled with since they became a people even up to this day and age. 
idolatry. They just couldn't stop putting things on the level of God. When you deify anything, you humanize God. You cannot give something in your life a promotion without giving God a demotion. Are you understanding this? God hates idolatry. And all through the history of Israel, when God led them out of Egyptian bondage through the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness. And what God is doing is he's getting idolatry out of their system. They came from a polytheistic worship center or system. Polytheistic, it simply means many gods. Poly, many, theism, God, many gods. The Egyptians had a lot of gods. God was making a statement to the children of Israel in the wilderness. You're not in that kind of system anymore. You are not worshiping many gods. You don't need to have a god for the river, a Nile River, and a god for agriculture, and a god for health, and a god for the weather. Because I am all in one. All you need is me. So you don't need to worship any other gods. You don't need, watch this, you don't need to get your nails done here and you, you get do your bacon over there and, 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 and do eat McDonald's over there and get your groceries over here. I am the Walmart you need. I'm... I'm everything you need. I'm the one-stop shop of your faith and your obedience. And this is what God was saying. Now, I wonder, I'm wonder. i going to walk through this because I don't, before we spit foam and holler and I raise my pants like I can do all this fancy stuff, I'm interested with us being uh, uh, familiarized with the whole concept of idolatry. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God told them something. I need you to go to your Bibles, Numbers chapter 33. We're going to look at verse number 52. I want you to see what God specifically tells them. Why, what God tells them concerning himself and what to do. They had left a polytheistic system where, they worship, where, where the land was worshiping other gods. Egyptians had other gods. And that's why the plagues happened the way they happened. We said this before. The reason why God didn't just send one plague was because he wasn't making a statement about one God. He was making a statement about all the other gods Egypt had. Yeah. So he dealt with the Nile River and he said, look, I'm in charge. I'm, I'm, I'm greater than that God. He sent flies and locusts. He says, any God you had as it pertains to agriculture, I'm greater than that God. As a matter of fact, he sent boils that came on people and animals. Any God you had that protected your health, I'm greater than that. God. He was showing Egypt one thing and Israel something else. How often it is that God is showing the world one thing and the church something else. But the problem is when the church thinks like the world, then the church has to get the message that God is sending to the world and cannot get the message he's sending to them. Some of us are just now getting the message that God meant for us because we were acting like the world so that the message that God was sending in the world we sat among the world and got that message God was not telling Israel that I'm greater than the Nile River God he was telling Egypt but the fact that they worship these gods with the Egyptians meant that the message meant for Egypt was actually also meant for Israel does that make sense look what he says in numbers chapter 33 numbers chapter 33 beginning just read verse number 52 what does the Bible say then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land then you shall you. drive out now he's telling you when you get to Canaan when you get to Canaan you are entering another polytheistic region there was polytheistic religious systems in Egypt many gods where you're going those people worship different gods the wilderness is where God was saying I am God but when you go to Canaan, you drive out the people, read. And destroy all their figured stones. You got to get rid of all of their figured stones, read. And destroy all their molten images. Get rid of all of their molten images, read. And demolish all their high places. Get rid of all of their high places. Why? Because I don't need all of that. That's not you. That's them. 
That's their idol worship. Now, you say this is not relevant because we don't, we don't worship idols today, and that's the problem. We, when we take an objective view of idol worship, we start thinking of Buddha and, and things like that, and that's the problem. But you think the devil is that ignorant? The devil's slick. He knows some of you ain't going to bow down to no golden uh, calf. He knows that ain't going to work with us. So how does the devil get us? He doesn't get us with bowing down to things like that and bowing before Buddha and bowing before. As a matter of fact, some of us won't even have, barely have a problem with respect, yet alone worshiping somebody. Y'all don't have to say amen. This is, it's open season. It's open season right now. So he's not getting us that way. He, we're not going to build no shrines. When was the last time you built a shrine to anything? Raise your hand if you built a literal shrine to anything. No, you don't do that. But we do build shrines and we do have high places in our hearts. And there are things in our hearts that we have elevated to the place of God. And we're not bowing down with our knees. We're bowing down with our hearts. And we're making idols out of things that are tangible, not physically, but in our hearts and in our minds. That's all right. That's all right. He says, tear down the high places. Tear down the literal high places. Now, what happens? Time goes on. Time passes. They, they go through the wilderness. They get into the Canaan's land. You have Joshua. You have Judges. And you have Ruth. You have the time of the, uh, of, the, of the quest of Canaan. You have the Judges. Those are hundreds of years. This is hundreds of years later in our text. Now watch this. Oh God, this is good. Hezekiah steps on the scene. Now you need to know something about Hezekiah's daddy. Hezekiah's daddy worshiped idols. Hezekiah was a prince before he was a king. His daddy, biologically, his daddy's name was Ahaz. And the Bible says in chapter 16 of 2 Kings, at around verse number 12, everybody look there, and I'm almost done. Maybe. <laughs> Let's start with verse number 2, not 12. Now watch this. I'm going to show you something. Let me show you his daddy. Because you know what? A lot of us blame the problems we have on our parents. I'm about to get all in. I got to be really relevant with this. I struggle with this message. I'm going to tell you the truth. I struggle with this message. I, was, I struggle with where, where do I put it? I'm not always excited to give the message that God has for us. Number one, especially when the message cuts me first. I mean, who wants to hold a razor blade that doesn't have a handle? Mercy. Mercy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The second thing is, sometimes I fall victim to wanting to excite you. Yeah, every preacher does. If every preacher that's worth his salt were honest, would say, they would say that they fall victim to wanting to move the people. But God doesn't always want to move people to excitement. Sometimes he wants to move people to repentance. Because excitement isn't worth anything if you're excited and not in the right place you need to be with God. It's dangerous to be excited and not be right with God. That's a dangerous place to be in. All excited, all happy. As a matter of fact, there's something wrong if you can be happy without God. So God is not in the business of making us happy first. He's in the business of making us holy first. Because once you're holy, you're on the right ground to be legitimately happy. And some of us want to be happy without being holy. God is calling us to be holy first. As he was calling his people. King Ahaz, chapter 16, verse number 2. Somebody read that. Now, I'm, I'm going to be kind. Please read. Also was 20 years when he came to king. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. Look what he did. Read. And he reigned 16 years. Reigned 16 years. Read. And he did not what was right in the sight of the Lord, he, his God. Wait a minute. He didn't do right in the sight of the Lord, his God, like who? As his father David had done. Wait a minute. Ahaz's biological father was not David. That wasn't his father. 
But the text, the narrative of the text keeps talking about this guy David. Talks about David and when it comes to Hezekiah, he did right like his father David. But that was not their father. Biologically. I'm going to show you why. I'm going to t- I'm, we're going to explain why in a moment. Read. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, which were, and, and, so you had Judah in the south, Israel in the north. There was not a good king in Israel. All of them were just corrupt. All of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel were corrupt. All of them were bad. Not one good king w- was established in the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah had some good kings. Right? Had to. Guess guess who was going to come through Judah? Who, guess who was going to come through Judah? Jesus. So everybody couldn't be messed up. There were some messed up people. But everybody couldn't be messed up because Jesus was coming through Judah. Read. And he even made his sons pass through the fire. Uh, right. According, according to the abominations of the nation whom the Lord had driven. Okay. Read I'll, verse number four. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and he on the hills. He sacrificed and he burned incense. Where? On the high places. High places were elevated pieces of land that they would put altars on and they would put figures on and they would carve out images and they were elevated pieces of land. And the reason why they were elevated so that when they came and burned incense, if this was the high place and this was the image, they would be below it, burning incense, bowing to it, offering sacrifices to it. They were subservient to them. Even in their physical posture, it was above them. It was elevated, elevated. This kind of idolatry came through by means of elevation. They were always associated with high places. Elevating their altars, elevating their images, their false images. Now I know that sounds good and you say, what does that have to do with us? But you can see where you are by looking at what you elevate. That's the key. What are you elevating? Because these false gods, these images would always be in high places. Even if it was in the valley, it would be an elevated part of the valley where they would worship these false gods. Now, idolatry still exists today on, and the way to see it is to look in your own life and what are you elevating in your own life? What are you raising up? What are you subservient to in your own heart? Because whatever it is that you elevate to the place of where only God belongs is becoming and has become your idol. Why are you preaching on this, JK? Why not preach on prayer is the key? Faith unlocks the door. I'm going through this, that, and the other. Because God wants us to be right with him. And the problem is, you will never be right with God until you be rid of something else. You cannot be right with God and not be rid of something that is opposed to the, to the, to the holiness and to the Godhead of God. So this is what they did, okay? They, Ahaz, that was, that was Hezekiah's dad. So we get to chapter, chapter 18, our text, and Hezekiah is not having it. He's leading God's people. There's revival. There is revival. And the way he does it is he starts tearing stuff down. He tears down the idols. He tears down the high places. The hardest points in my life is when I'm trying to hold on to something unlike God in my life while trying to hold on to God. It doesn't work. And so it would not work with God's people. So Hezekiah tore down, watch this, what his father put up. Some of our idols come from our history. Some of our idols come from our family history. Some of the problems we have, we have propensities for them because of our background. And sometimes you have to tear down what somebody in your past built up. 
And if you're not willing to do that, you're not willing to have God on the seat of your heart. Now watch this. Don't use your past as an excuse for why you can't do it. I'm about to get close. Since you're listening, let me get close. If you're addicted to pornography, because your parents were, your dad was, or you addicted to alcohol, because oh, that's all I saw coming up. Uh, you, you addicted to abusing women, that's all I saw. You addicted to going in and out of relationships that are not going over with, that's all I saw. You know what? I know I'm spiritual, but I'm human. That's the problem. You are human. And that's the problem. And that's the part of you that's holding the high place. That's stopping you from putting God where he belongs. Is it comfortable to tear down what, what's stopping God from being the head of your life? No, it's not comfortable. It is not convenient. It means you may have to cry. It means you may have to lose some friends. It means some things you used to be able to do before. You can't do them anymore. But you can't hold on to an idol and hold on to God. You got to tear down your high place. Even if it's in your family. Even if it's in your family. Hezekiah was not so consumed to being loyal to his father's legacy that he did not tear down the high places. That's all right. The Bible says he tore them down. And it says he did right like his father David. Why does David keep popping up in this? David was not their biological father. Now I'm about to get real close. David committed adultery. And we hear that, but we don't feel it. We don't feel that. We don't feel that. We, we hear it. You know, we theorize scripture. We don't, we don't feel it. And the reason why sometimes we don't feel that is because we know how the whole story goes. But I need to put yourself in the middle of David's story. Don't go to the end. If you want to connect emotionally to the scripture, don't go to the end and how it turns out. Go to the middle and sit there for a while. Sit there for a while. And watch David hook up with Bathsheba. Watch him as he looks over his shoulder. Watch her as she looks and makes sure there's no view, no, no, that Uriah is nowhere in sight. Watch them as they begin to start petting each other. The passion heats up. The morning comes. The next month, she misses her monthly. Who was David? He was, a, he was a king. He was a man of God. I know we don't get it as the people of God. Because when, when we're confronted with that, we don't put together that it can possibly end the same way with David. As David did. What we want to do is we... We get stuck there in real life, but we, that's because we don't get stuck there with David. We, we don't stay there a while. This is what David did. Now watch this. That's not even it. When he finds out she's pregnant, right? She's eating relish and jelly sandwiches. She waking up in the morning throwing up. He calls in. Her husband and says, take a break. This is some conniving stuff. Take a break, take a break, go home. You've been fighting, you're working so hard. You know, I the king give you permission. I give you a leave of absence. How you looking at David now? Shy stay. 
Tell you what, if you ever want to look at to see some shitey people, look in the scripture. That's all right. There are two things you can look at if you want to see some shitey people. You can look in the scripture or you can look in the mirror. You'll see shitey people in both. Look in the mirror. You want to see somebody shysty look in the mirror? Well, I didn't do that. Yeah, but you do something and it's shysty. And since he couldn't get Uriah to sleep with his wife, he sets it up to where Uriah is at the hottest part of the battle. Uriah gets killed. Then he turns around and marries Bathsheba. That's shysty, isn't it? But yet we read here. That Hezekiah Come on now. did what was pleasing to God, like David his father. One of the things that the Bible calls David is a man after God's own heart. It does not mean that David was perfect, but it means in all of his perfection, did he ever, ever, never try to replace God? Let me help you understand that. He fell, he messed up, he lied, he was shysty, he slept with someone, impregnated her, killed her husband, but at no point did he bring in another God. At no point did he decide, I'm just going to be rid of God. He lived with his guilt. His guilt convicted him. Nathan approached him. He didn't say, I don't serve that God anymore. He went to God, broken and contrite, and said, I have sinned against you alone. He was constantly wanting to make God proud even when he didn't. It is only when you compare your problem to other people that you can feel lofty. But if gossip was having sex, you'd be pregnant five times over. Come on, y'all not with me. I'm sorry, raw is the only way you can eat this sushi. Because there's a difference between falling away from God and replacing God. Now, I know some of you more conservative thinkers are thinking, it sounds like <laughs> you are given a sanctified okay. And people always run to David. I've heard that. People always run to David. And I hear that from people until they fall flat on their face. Come on now. We're not running to David. That's not as much about David as it is about God. Saul didn't do that much. And God rejected him. So here Hezekiah is. And he's getting rid of the high places. He's getting rid of the idols. But I'm going to show you how we can make idols out of religious things. Right. Verse number four of 2 Kings chapter 18 says this. It says, He removed the high places. He removed the high places. Watch this now. And oh, broke some good stuff, Nate. Some good stuff, Nate! <laughs> Read. And broke down the sacred pillars. Uh huh. And cut down the asherah. Now we understand the asherah pose. That was a false god. But look what he did. Read. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that whoa, Moses had whoa, made. Whoa, hold up, wait a minute. You do know what the bronze serpent was, don't you? Remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and God sent in serpents to bite them? And Moses was told by God to make a serpent and out of, out of uh, bronze and put it on the pole. And whoever looked at that serpent on the pole, he shall live. This is hundreds of years later. Guess what the people did? They kept it. They kept the bronze serpent. And not only did they keep it, but they started worshiping it. Because at some point, they disassociated 
the serpent on, on the pole from the God who gave the remedy. And whenever we get to the point where we innately grow more attached to the means of God's salvation, it won't be long before we worship the means like God is the one alone that should be worshipped. What does that mean? They took this serpent and they were worshipping it. When I was a kid, and I told this at the early service, uh, I remember getting some Superman shoes, sneakers. <laughs> See, the, what you don't know about these guys is when we talk later, they bring up stuff like that and hold it over my head. <laughs> it's a very abusive process. But it, some of you remember, you, you give your kids something like that, man, and all of a sudden, look, Daddy. And they start running. And I, and I thought that I ran faster <laughs> because I had those Superman tennis shoes on. And uh, yeah, yeah, your kids did too. You know, you'd be like, look, oh man, you get them some, 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 some Batman shoes. And they just, whoa, look at me. I run it, running the same pace he would run on. <laughs> and I go to school, look, yeah, look, look at my shoes. I bet you won't race me today. I bet you won't race me today. I bet you won't. I bet you won't. Because we have a tendency innately to tie things like that and our ability and ways that we have been improved to things. And, it's, and we're, it's a fine line there between worshiping God and worshiping the means by which he delivers us. And we do it all the time. And we raise a high place in our hearts. Because the raise and the job that gave you the raise and the job that got all the benefits is the means by which God has taken care of you. But what we do is we, watch this, we raise a high place in our hearts. And when it comes time to choose between that job that God gave us and God, because of that high place in our heart, God loses. And here's the thing. If God doesn't have the seat, he won't be in the room. Are you, hear me Mountain View, hear me, hear me. Because it might be that this church, it could possibly be, that before God lets us do what we're trying to do, that we need to get rid of some idols. I, you know, I struggle. I struggle in my spirit hard with this. I, I, I've, I've, spoke to, I've spoke to some of the elders, to a couple of the elders about it and preachers, and, and I'm, I'm getting it. God says, I'm not going, I, why would I? Why would I bless this transition? With all of the high places you have. Right. Right. Why would I bless you the most? Right. If you're not giving me all the glory at 4111, right. why would you give me the glory at 7979? If you're not giving me all the glory with the job you have, and you kissing, you, you kissing up and doing dances and laughing at corny jokes because you think this is what you have to do to please the gods you've erected in your mind who hired you. Why would I elevate you when you're not elevating me? Hear this in your spirit, Mountain View. And this is for everybody. This is for the pulpit to the last seat. For everybody. If we're going to move forward, we have got to break down some idols. We've got to break the high places down. Some of our high places is how we look. We bank a lot on how we look. And if we spent that much time in prayer as we spent in front of the mirror. I know, I know, I know, I know. Let, let, me, let me just tell you this, and we're, we're, just, we're almost done. Uh, and I'm going to give you some points. 
uh, when, whenever, whenever my mom and dad comes, but mo my mom comes more than my dad, she likes to sit in a certain seat. And sometimes when my parents come in town, they, uh, other people come over. And she, there's a certain chair in my life that she likes to sit in a seat, certain seat. Uh, I don't have that seat anymore. I moved it to, my, to, to, the, to another room, but it was like a recliner. And sometimes when people are over and she's sitting there, she'd get up, right? And uh, go to the bathroom or do whatever. And when she come back, somebody else is sitting there. And they'll be, and, uh, they'll be like, you want me to get up? She says, no, 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 stay there. And then she'll go to another room. She, no, 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 stay there. But then she go to an old, another complete room. Because in that room, that's where she sits. And if she's not sitting in that chair, in that room, she'd rather be in another room. Now watch, that's number one. Number two is, it wasn't that person's job to give up that seat. At my house. It's my job. That's my mom. It's my job. Oh, can you get up and let my mom sit there? Yeah. My job. Right. And every now and then my mom would look over at me like. <laughs> Anybody got the kind of mama that will look that, that, that will say a whole, I mean, she, she, she give you a whole narrative with a look. I mean, it won't even be, you know, it, it'll be like. And, and what won't break the smile on her face? <laughs> then I caught on and I said, "Hey, man, get it, get up. Let my mom sit there." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris has been over when, when my mom said, "Hey, hey, Chris, let my mom, let my mom, let my mom get it." You've been over once or twice. Because if my mom is not going to sit in that seat, she ain't going to be in that room. And if God is not going to sit in that seat, he ain't going to stay in that room. So every now and then what you and I need to learn to do with anything else that's coming close to being on the place of God, what we need to learn to do is say, get up. God has to sit there. Get up. Oh yeah, God likes this. Money, get up. Finances, get up. Fashion, get up. Sex, get up. Immorality, get up. Other relationships, get up. Because if God is going to be in this house, he has to have that seat. And some of us let people and things stay exactly where they are, even if we are risking losing God being in that room. That is, my brothers and my sisters, modern day idolatry. We can't be in this relationship. Get up. Get up. That's God's seat. We friends, we partners, get up, man. Because if I am not getting closer to God because of me and you, then God ain't in the room. If I'm getting further away from God because I'm dealing with you, God ain't in the room. You sitting in the wrong seat, baby, get up. I'm so sorry, Pinky, you so nice. You see, sweet and misty, you look nice. You got your glasses tilted over. You look just like a school teacher. But well, baby, get up. I turn to somebody and say, it's not your seat! How does idolatry happen as we close? Uh, the misrepresentation of God. Some of us call everything God. And everything is not God. 
God is misrepresented. First Kings chapter 12, if you get a chance to read it, Jeroboam decided it would take too much for the people of Israel to travel way to Jerusalem to worship. And he didn't want them getting addicted and getting stuck and getting committed to worshiping God in Jerusalem. So what Jeroboam did is he said, I'm going to give the people an alternative. And I'm going to build an image in Dan and an image in Samaria. And I'm going to tell them that these are the gods that got you out of Egypt. And then if that's not enough, when we get to chapter 13 and the last few verses of chapter 13, what he starts doing is he lowers the standard and he starts making priests out of anybody. Because whenever you reduce God, you can't have an A1 leadership if you reduce God to anything other than first. You will not have A1 friends and God is, is, is second or third because God won't be there. So he started ordaining people as priests, anybody who wanted to be a priest and he cheapened God. And the best way to cheapen worship and to cheapen the church is for God not to be on top. Whenever church no longer has God as, as its primary as, as its priority and primary person, I guarantee you that church is subject to do anything, any kind of way. And watch this, becoming carnal as a church is as smooth and subtle as hot water turning cold or cold water turning hot. You ever jump in the shower and turn it on and it's hot or too cold and you turn it? You really can't identify at what point cold turn into hot. It just happened. And carnality happens that way because when God is no longer first, your immune system is open to any other God. Number two, the misplacement of faith. First Samuel chapter three, verse number three, the children of Israel took the ark of God and they said, as they were going against the Philistines, maybe if we get the ark of God, it will save us from the Philistines. They were trying to win without the MVP. They took the MVP's jersey and they thought they could win with the jersey and not the player. And let me show you how idolatry slips in in the church. Because there are people that believe they're close to God because they come to church. And there are people that believe they're close to God because they have a cross yeah. of jewelry or you get a tattoo, a scripture on your body. You could be at the club doing your own thing with this word right on your body, gigging it, getting in, crip walking, booty shaking, all of that kind of stuff. Come on now. Sorry, sorry, this is real Sunday. What you should have said is gluteus gyrating. No, 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 you know, let's call it what it is. And then some of us will lose with the things of God. I preached a lesson a while ago. You can lose with the things you use just because you, let me tell you something. When you prioritize anything of God, you, anything of God will never take the place of God. Let me say that again. There's nothing that is of God that will ever take the place of God. The ark was the ark of God. But they lost with the ark of God because they wanted to replace God with the ark of God. And the reason why they wanted to replace God with the ark of God is because you can control and you had a certain amount of control over something tangible. But the reason why that doesn't work with God is God is not tangible. You can't control God tangibly you can't carry God you can't lift God there's nothing you can do for God that God can't do for himself and so guess what if he says no you got to live with it they misplace their faith in the things of God and there's nothing that is of Christ that will ever take the place of Christ there's nothing that is of Christ that deserves the worship and adoration of Christ and we are the church 
of Christ. Some of y'all miss that. There is nothing of Christ that should ever take the adoration of Christ. And we are the church of Christ. Which means that because of who we are does not mean that being part of the church of Christ is an excuse to eclipse Christ with his church. We will never, ever be able to replace Christ. And you better learn that Mountain View. Learn it Mountain View. Got folk leaving because of people. I'm just going to leave. I don't like that church. I don't like that. He said this. She said that. You don't get it. There's nothing of Christ that will ever eclipse or replace Christ. When you make Christ out of a person, when you make God out of a person, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And you're setting up a high place. And an idol. Not only that, as we close, that's my second close. <laughs> Who said it's all right? Let me see you. Thank you. Damani, one of the praise leaders, said it's all right. In Exodus 32, something weird happens with the children of Israel. Moses goes up on the mountain. I'm going to tell you when we're most vulnerable to replacing God and raising a high place in our heart. This is the most vulnerable time. The children of Israel were left at the foot of the mountain. Moses goes up to the mountain. It's Mount Sinai to get the law. While Moses is up on Mount Sinai, getting the law the people are down below growing impatient Come on now. they thought that because Moses was gone God was gone so watch what they do they put pressure on Aaron to melt down their earrings and their jewelry and their, and their jewels and their silver and their gold to make this calf then they say this is the God now what they they say this is the God that got us out of Egypt they weren't saying the calf did it I had to go deeper with that they were saying this calf represents God because what I've learned is when God has taken too long to say something we will erect a high place so that we can move on our time. Okay, watch this now. I'm going to say this. When we're in a fix and we're at a standstill and God has taken too long to fix the situation to where we can move forward, be careful that we don't erect and create another God so that we can go when God did not say go. Because sometimes God will let you live with the gods you created when you were impatient waiting on him. I wonder if there's anybody who has to deal with a God they created now that God has moved them forward, you still have to deal with a God you created in your mind. And now that disappointment is following you everywhere you go. The people of Israel did not want to wait on the invisible God. So they worship and erected another God so that they can have the comfort and they could escape the silence of God. And when we don't want to wait, this little weird period right now with this church, with, 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 with our congregation, where we're in, in the discomfort of uh, where we are, and we see where we're going, be careful 
Because the decisions you make in between often matter the most. Wait on God. You don't need a calf. You don't need to erect a meantime God. Wait! Wait! On God! You don't need to grow restless and say what we're going to do is we're going to shift our priority and we're going to make a God out of who gives the most money. We're going to make a God out of who's the most active. We're going to make a God out of who's the most involved. We're going to make a God out of the preacher, out of the assistant ministers, out of the elders, out of the deacons. At no point does God give us permission to replace him in your life when you're not hearing from God, when God is not saying anything, when he's not showing you nothing, when he's not being a parent, when he's not clearly telling you what to do. Wait! Because if not, you fool around and erect a God in your heart. And the way God's work, they don't just let you go because you want to go. Sin doesn't even do that. Sin doesn't do that. You know what sin is like? False God. And I'm 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 done. I'm tired. <laughs> sin is like saying, I'm gonna walk three miles. I'm gonna leave my car keys at home. Anybody ever take a long walk like that? The problem with a three mile walk is it's three miles to get there. <laughs> and it's three miles to get back. Oh, don't think uh, I'm gonna walk the three miles and, and I'm gonna leave my phone and my keys at home and make sure I do it. Uh, I'm so sorry. You get out there at the third mile, you say, I'm done, guess what? You might be done with with the miles, but the miles are not done with you. But the beauty of it is you can turn around. You may not be walking with the same zest you had. (laughs) But you can make your way back. And my final point is this. Here's what you do. To avoid tearing, uh, your idols because you, some of you have and, and this is a come to Jesus sermon because some of you got some high places some of your aspirations are your high place and you call in God when you think you need him that is the most that is the worst satanic lie you do what you do do what you can and you trust God for the rest. That's the biggest lie the devil. That is the slickest lie the devil has ever told. Do what you can and trust God with the rest. There is no you can without God. That's all right. I'm going to get a little improper with my diction in English. What is you saying? <laughs> Do the best you can and trust God for that. No, there is no you can without God. So this is what you do. Prioritize God. Write this down. Start prioritizing God. And this is going to be the quickest part. I'm, I'm done. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. First. Start putting God first. How does that look? How does that look literally? You know, we say prioritize. That doesn't mean getting up and saying, I want to thank God who's the head of my life. That's not prioritize. That's lip service. Prioritizing God. And this is hard. This is hard at times. Because it's going to test your faith. And I've learned that I, me, I stop praying when I know 
God's answer is not going to be. Sometimes in my life, the times in my life where I pray the least is when I know that what God is going to tell me is not going to be what I want. Is there anybody that didn't pray because you, you knew that God was, you know, somebody said, you pray about it? Uh, mm. I, pray for, I pray for everything. That wasn't the question. When you know, when you know it's not of God. Because you can't pray about something that God is not okay with and say, Lord, bless it. So we, 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 so prioritizing God means, okay, include his preeminence in everything. Okay? It doesn't, it's easy to say keep God first, but what does that look like? Okay, you, you got, you, but you're about to go to school, right? You're about to go off to school. You're about to, you're trying to figure out your education. Treat God like you did your mama. I'm going to call my mama and talk about, uh-uh. You prioritize God by consulting him first. Okay? Practice this. Practice this. And this is for everybody. Practice this. Practice this. That's why the devil's thing is to get you from talking to God so that you can make decisions on your own. Consult God first. Then then pursue God. Number two, what does it mean to pursue God? David was called a man after God's own heart. You will never deserve his grace, otherwise it wouldn't be grace. But you know what the pursuit is? I tell you, little kids have it, have it down pat. Little kids have, have pursuing their parents down pat. They have it perfectly. You ever watch a child? You feel a little tap on your leg? Look, I did this. Now he's not trying to win your love. You love him. But he wants to make you proud. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Now, my kids don't do, I, I, Carol and I, our kids don't do that anymore because they kind of getting old now. So now we got to, we, we went from look at me to I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> Bad preacher. <laughs> but when they were small, Dad, Daddy, look at me. Janice was the last of the Mohegans on this. Daddy, Daddy, look at me. Look at me. Look, I drew this. Look. <laughs> so when I substitute teach sometimes, I, I love the little, little the babies, the second graders. Mr. Hamilton, I drew this, and it just be a, just a, a little ugly picture of that's supposed to be me. <laughs> and I said, who is this? That's you. Now, I ain't got two strings of hair sticking out the top of my head. There. You know that I don't. Now, I could say, you know that ain't me. Go back to the drawing board and do a better job. <laughs> Go do a better job with this. This is unacceptable. No, no, no. I'm not going to do that because I know they're pursuing. Yeah. All, all they want, they want affirmation. I, you know, I, I regard you so highly that I'm pursuing you. I, w- I want to make you happy, God. I want to say, Father, look at me. Look at me. I'm telling somebody about Jesus. Look at me. Not for the praises of men. Because they're short-lived. Oh, Lord, I'm learning that now more than ever. God is teaching me a good lesson on the flipticity of people. I don't put nothing past nobody now. Flipticity. I know that's not a word. I know it's not a word, but some of y'all are going to use it because it sounds good, right? You go, it'll be in the dictionary two years from now. It'll be a, let's make it a word, people. Let's make it a word. Flipticity. Oh, you're not speaking to me today? Flipticity. Oh, somebody told you something about me? Flipticity. Oh, you in a bad mood? You think I'm ignoring you? I'm going to do this one more time. Let me do this one more time. You mad at me because somebody else is angry at me? Flipticity. I declare that word. But it's the pursuit of God. And then thirdly, praise God. Start attributing every little thing to him. 
Don't break it down. Watch this. Sometimes we break it down too much. We say, oh, this is how it happened. Such and such, talk to such and such, such and such, such and such, talk to such and such. Oh, man, I'm so glad I made that relationship here. No. If you prioritize God, you'll praise him first. Because nobody can make an arrangement for your life like God. Nobody. Everybody stand to your feet. Give God some praise in this house. So it's come to Jesus' time. Somebody has a high place you need to tear down. You need to tear down your high place. You know what it is. You know where it is. If you need to tear down a high place and you want to start all over with the Lord, you say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I've been putting other things in front of you. My pride in front of you. Relationships in front of you. My career in front of you.